Okay, so um, yeah, there are actually some seats, there are two seats here in front, if you want to sit down. Yeah, so what uh, I want to do is uh, give you a bit of, um, um, of the initial experiences with the instrument that, uh, <coughs> and that Ole just described, and, uh, and then uh, uh, where it fits in the clinical workflow, we think, and, and also many other workflows. So, um, and this is um, joint work, and that's spearheaded in my lab by Philip Geyer, who's also spearheading the plasma proteome workflow, and, and also these um, students here. So, <coughs> yeah, and our labs uh, are both in Max Planck and in Copenhagen, but, but the work here is, is uh, from, um, <coughs> most of it is from Max Planck. So, I want to give you a bit of history. So uh, Ole and I go, go back many years, as he said. He was actually my first master student. And uh, that was many years ago. And <coughs> I was living in Odense as well, where Evosep is in Denmark. And Ole and I actually had this company together that he mentioned the first one, Protana. So that's him, that's me, and that's our building here. So that was, uh, that, was that time. And then he moved on, so I had nothing to do with that, but he, had, he moved on to... Uh, found a new company, Proxeo, and that was then bought by Thermo, and, and that's what the instrument that many of you have standing in front of your uh, mass specs. And then uh, with um, um, Bruca Interlude, and, um, and then they now um, found a new company, because, but because of my old connection to Ole, I'm also involved in that, so I'm involved not in an active role, but as an investor in, in this company. So that's um, background and, and my relation to Evosep. And then um, we first thought, uh, and Ola also thought that, that um, it would be for niche application, so where you would run a lot of samples in, in a rapid way, so similar to this concept of, of this, um, you know, just diluting from the stage ship. But then it evolved, and as I will show you, we, we now think it can do not only everything, but also everything much better. So uh, again, this is Philip here. Um, he's here at the conference and is doing the uh, plasma proteomes pro uh, project, but uh, also working uh, on the beta testing of that instrument. And 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 uh, one of the reasons is that we actually do want to use it in the plasma proteomes project. And this is Nikolai Barker, who's um, also sitting here. And uh, it's been a lot of fun working with the team at Evosep, and I also. Uh, encourage you to go to the Evosep website um, because you can find information there and so on. But also, uh, Nikolai has made these uh, interviews with uh, quite a number of people, and they are fun to watch. So they last like two minutes, and they um, um, you, you can watch as the instrument develops, as well as he's made interviews with people in the field what they think about clinical proteomics. So and, and he's continuing to do that. So that's um, instrument in our lab in. Um, Munich, and we have, actually there's three of them, so there's th uh, two of these final finished, and then there's the uh, breadpot that has moved up to the facility because they want to do top-down work with it. Um, <coughs> yeah, so indeed uh, the, the promise was um, the stability, because especially if you want to go into the clinic, we cannot like always uh, fiddle with a nano LC, and, um, and it's known from... Um, uh, so the mass spectrometer is actually in the clinic, but only for small molecules, and they do high flow. And with the high flow, they have no, no problem, so they run thousands of times. And, and that was the promise here, that we would have um, the advantage of the high flow, but in a uh, package that would retain the sensitivity of the low flow. So then we got this, and, um, and <clears throat> they tested it. And uh, of course, then um, you can find errors. So this is the error frequency, and then um, these were resolved, and then they, um, so the last um, um <coughs> here had, had no errors, or at least no errors uh, associated with the machine. And we have now more than 4,500 runs on, on that machine already, and, and they build up quickly because they have a, a high cycle time. <coughs> so by now, the machine is super robust, and, um, uh, and the remaining issues are more like with the loading uh, in the front. So then, and these are, for example, 2,000 HeLa runs, which you can do in just 17 days. So you put that in front of one of the old uh, orbit traps, and then it runs, and this just gives you a few extracted peptides, how they 
uh, how they're uh, stable over the time. And then, as Ole said, then one other promise was uh, low cross um, co um, contamination, which is important in the clinical because you don't want cross contamination from one patient to another. And here, that's avoided by having um, a, a new tip, uh, so-called Evo tip, um, kind of based on the stage tip, um, and that <coughs> and um, it was a new one, and then indeed the uh, cross combination is, is very low, and it's just if in the plasma it's just a few, a handful of sticky peptides. Otherwise, there's no cross contamination. So then, <coughs> the um, uh, one sweet spot for this instrument to be employed is in in uh, uh, short runs because uh, we have um, run this already. These short runs uh, in the plasma context because there are not so many peptides. There's no reason to have a long gradient, but then uh, we went back from the 20 to the 45, and the reason was that we have expensive instruments, and I don't want to have them idle half the time, right? This would be not good for the taxpayer. So then uh, um, so then we went back, but we actually don't get much more, and uh, and now with the Evocep, we can do the 21-minute gradient with only three-minute overhead, so there uh, uh, we have uh, 50, or depending on how you count it, even more. Um, uh, throughput and, and with this particular gradient, which is a nice gradient for a lot of applications with the fast instruments now, uh, we can get 60 proteomes per day. And then, as Ole explained, there's these different um, settings and they could also be extended if, if that was necessary. So then, um, this opens up a number of um, applications. So, if you have a low complexity mixture and, and you can run it very fast with one of these fast methods, or uh, what's now uh, very popular is this um, fractionation with this uh, high pH concatenation, and they can produce many, um, uh, many fractions. And our contribution to this was, um, like we published earlier this year, so we used the high pH concatenation principle, but people were typically using uh, big columns, and then um, you need a lot of material, so, so that didn't work for us, and, and we or, or uh, rather Niels Kulak in the lab thought of this uh, lossless fractionator or spider fractionator where, um, <coughs> where there's actually a valve and instead of um, fractionate, being fractionated in an output and then concatenated, it's automatically uh, with this um, uh, with capillaries, it's uh, automatically uh, collected in a number of fractions and you can choose from like two fractions to 96 uh, fractions, whatever you want. And, uh, and by the design, there should be no loss. And as far as we can tell, there is also no loss of the sample. So we can start with very low amounts. And that's, so that's another company, but I don't have uh, involvement with them. And that's uh, Priomics here. And they do, um, um, they do um, sorry, um, some uh, reagents. They also have the company. And, and they will bring this on the market uh, uh, in, in, the, in the near future. So anyway, so that's uh, a good um, combination, and then we can do a lot of uh, fractions. And then uh, the way we want to go with that is, is shown here in a paper by um, Jesper Olsen from the Protein Institute in Copenhagen. He's sitting right here. And what he showed in a fantastic paper earlier this year in cell systems that uh, he, he can get basically complete proteome of a cell line, so as judged by deep sequencing. And the way he did that with many fractions, in that case it wasn't even concatenated, uh, and uh, but but then they run very short runs and this now works very well with these very fast instrument like the um, HF which they did this on it even works even better with the uh, HFX and they, they, um, so they can um, do a very deep proteome and see f uh, phosphorylation sites for instance without even enriching for them and I'm putting up here because this works very well with uh, if you ha also have a uh, you know, if you can bring the a gradient, um, <coughs> to, so you can run these many fractions in a short time. So, um, and another application of that same principle is that um, I'm going to show now. So normally we use the Orbitrap here, but we're also quite excited about a collaboration with Bruca, and that I talked about in the lunch seminar yesterday for those that heard uh, about it. And and the reason is that the uh, time of flight also has some very nice advantages, and and one of the advantages is a very fast scan speed. Um, so you always get the full resolution by the nature of TOF, and then you get very, very fast scan speed. And um, in the work with uh, Bruca, so they, they developed this uh, principle where they've tapped ion mobility mass spectrometry, so TIMS, so that's the invention of Mel Parks. 
and um, and then uh, so basically the peptides are stored here. The wind blows them here, or the, the source pressure blows them here, and the, there's uh, um, electric field that way that makes the potential gradient. And according to their ion mobility, they are stored, and then you can let them out at, at precisely the rate you want. And then uh, we uh, contributed this passive principle to this, where we now uh, let them out the ions one after another or continuously, and if the quadrupole is quick enough, it can catch them as they come out. And the advantage of that is that you have the, the speed, sorry, uh, you have the full speed, but you don't, by increasing the speed, uh, you don't decrease the sensitivity because you still have the full accumulation time. So that's called PASF, and, um, and um, that works very well and it's incredibly sensitive. And uh, yeah, then in the eye mobility map, you, uh, the quadrupole jumps uh, between the different masses, and that was before. And this, uh, so this is in a 1.4 second, and we get uh, up to 10 or <coughs> or even more uh, events here for each of these segments. So you get here um, 10 uh, passives, and then uh, in each of them you you can get 10 or, or 12 here. So and I'm showing it here because this uh, we think uh, can be a very nice. Uh, um, collaboration, or this can be a very nice uh, um, a combination of um, the fast HPLC and then here um, uh, the readout. So in due time, uh, when this is further developed, it could even give you um, like a very deep uh, characterization in a very short time. In any case, it wouldn't be before uh, because you didn't have enough sequencing event because you can have more than 100 per second. So we have actually put already this instrument in, in front of the um, of the Timstoff or passive Timstoff, and uh, so that's shown here in in the cellar in in the Martin Street, and um, and we're already just getting the first data. So we're pretty confident that this will be a, a very nice uh, combination. But that's just um, <coughs> what, what we want to pursue with this. So normally we have it also in front of the Orbitrap. So then, uh, based on the principles of the instrument and the fact that that we have this quite high throughput, we've already now um, thought a lot about where we want to use it, and I just uh, won't show you data for that, but I will show you uh, what we're thinking. So for instance, um, uh, where, the, where we can use, for instance, this, uh, this here, a gradient very well, is uh, for pull-down, so instruments fast enough to catch everything in the pull-down now in 21 minutes. And we are thinking, uh, so we were one of the groups that had these yeast interactomes, but uh, that was many years ago, and we think we can do them much sooner now, and given the firepower from the instruments, particularly the HPLC, we are actually now uh, going to do the whole yeast interactome once more, and, and, in, uh, and we hope to be finished by Christmas. So, whereas it took, um, uh, yes, but no, it took uh, many years uh, for the first one. So, uh, yeah, then uh, un unexpected um, use of the instrument was in top-down. That, that didn't occur to us, but it uh, occurred to Naga, who's running the facility at our institute. So he figured out that you can actually put the proteins uh, that you cannot get to HPLC, you can put them on the stage tip with a detergent, and then you can run them out. And, and he thinks uh, that will be the future for many of the intact protein samples that are not readily soluble. Um, so then, um, yeah, I already showed you this. Uh, anything that goes in uh, highly fractionated, and, and, and then... Um, uh, uh, in multiplexing, so um, that's a good combination, right? You fractionate and you auto multiplex, so you get the throughput back, and uh, and and then this now allows you to do the fractions very rapidly. And then, uh, um, yeah, the main part of my talk will actually be about this for body fluids, where we go in the cl clinic with that, um, and <clears throat> but we're also building up a workflow, so. Um, on, on FFPE material, so we want to use it on, on cancer material, and uh, we believe, uh, or we know that in, even in 45 minutes, we can get very deep into the proteome, and, and there's billions of these FFPE samples waiting in hospitals over the world, and uh, there this uh, throughput, for instance, 60 or, or 30 would also be fine per, um, per day, uh, could make a huge difference, and, and we have the sensitivity advantage as well. Uh, then uh, something that um, we're very keen on, because my labs are starting metabolomics applications now, and <clears throat> we would hate to go back to the normal flow rate with metabolomics, as the, that community typically does. So there's, in my view, no reason for it, but the reason is purely convenience. Uh, and uh, then we think that the EvoCEP um, 
uh, would the, give you the convenience of the high flow metabolomics applications, but it would give, give it to you on the a low sample amount. So for instance, as I show later, we analyze these finger pricks and, um, and then we don't have to ask the people for like a, a milliliter of blood or 10 milliliters of blood, but we want to uh, do the metabolomics also from the finger prick. And this would allow us to scale down uh, to a microliter instead of 100 microliters or several hundred, and that would, uh, that would then uh, be enough material from a finger prick. And we have for the future a lot of other ideas, but but I don't have data on them, that this instrument could also be very good for very high sensitivity applications. But you can ask, about, ask me about that later, but we don't have data for that. So now um, um, I can give you some background here uh, on, on what we're thinking about the clinical application in general. So this has been become a focus of my group, and we really uh, want to now make this work with, uh, uh, with the blood. So it has some similarities to what you heard, heard from Leroy Hood in the opening talk on Sunday, uh, but we are coming more from uh, tools and nails and, and you're coming more from the mass spec technology. And uh, so this is a review that's, that's coming out in uh, a week or two in, in MSB and we put a lot of our ideas there and I have a couple of pictures that illustrate the principles that we uh, elucidate here in this, um, uh, in, in this um, review. So the, I should point out that, that the middle authors here, these are the professionals, so we are, of course, the amateurs when we come to, to the hospital and the clinical. Um, but, but these are, uh, they are the heads of the Munich hospital system um, and analysis. So they have millions of samples uh, per year, so they know uh, where we have to go and how much it can cost, too. So, uh, yeah, this is what we're up against. So this is, this is what you would see in their... their Labs, so these are ELISAs, but they're automated ELISAs, and they can do up to 1,000 samples per hour. And then the, uh, the CV has to be less than 20%, and all of this is uh, antibody-based uh, for, for, for this here. And there, there's like Siemens and some other vendors that sell these things, and they analyze the samples when you go to the doctor. They, they would say some protein level that, that comes from these machines. So as part of this review, we then uh, we took... Um, um, so, so we took state of, of what is actually the case now. So in clinical um, diagnostic, you, uh, um, so people uh, are assessed either with a lab-based or non-lab-based assessment, and then if it's a lab-based, then, um, then actually, interestingly, 50% of them are protein assays. So if you talk to the genomics people, you think everything is now done by genomics, and, uh, and, and proteins are completely boring, but... Uh, uh, but anyway, so 50% of the um, analysis when you are sick are actually done on the basis of proteins. And, uh, yeah, and, and these assays are unfortunately very old. So there's hardly any new ones now. Uh, but still, when you go to the doctor, so the plurality of medical decisions that are made on you when you're sick and go to the hospital are the, ba the level of proteins in the blood. So and, what, and, and they can measure all, overall over 600 parameters, and that's the proteins but they also look, can look for drugs and enzyme activities. These are super cheap and uh, substrates, and uh, they do a cell count and, and look for hormones and electrolytes. These are even cheaper, and they will look for vitamins and so on. So that's what's going to happen when you go to the clinical lab. Uh, but again, the majority of clinical uh, decisions are actually made on even now on the protein basis. And this is um, you know, one of those famous graphs, and this is from the data, uh, protein database. Uh, where they have actually also concentrations of the proteins, and then we did like a keyword annotation, but um, so usually it falls into like um, a high level uh, functional proteins in the plasma, and then this uh, tico, uh, tissue leakage protein range, uh, which doesn't, which don't have necessarily a function in the in the uh, plasma proteome, but they can still be markers because they can. Uh, indicate the integrity of a tissue or level of the protein in the underlying tissue where it comes from. And then you have here the very low level um, uh, messenger molecules like um, IL-6. So if you just say IL-6 and divide by this, then you are at 10 orders of magnitude. So that's the lower limit of the plasma proteome dynamic range. So this is what I already said, and that... Um, um, that um, the decisions are made on, on, on this basis, and uh, this is how the assays in this Munich uh, huge clinic are 
distributed over the year of 2016. So our idea is to, um, uh, so of course, um, Gil Omen and, and others in UPO have done heroic work and, and pushed this uh, plasma proteome forward for now uh, 15 years almost. And, um, uh, and there was a particular approach, which I will later contrast to what we're doing. Uh, but our idea was kind of simple-minded now. We want to just take a finger prick of blood and uh, we want to do a very fast analysis and then we will get a limited depth, uh, but maybe that's worth it because we still can learn a lot about uh, the patient. So that was our idea. And, um, and this is Philip again spearheading that and Sophia is also in a, in, in a tool on the Denmark side and, and, and many others in my group. So um, yeah, and the finger prick um, brings me to this story. So we are not the first uh, by any chance to think about uh, blood analysis and even also the ancient Greeks already know that was the way to go, you know, the, the humors in your blood. But also more recently, there's this uh, a company, Terranos, and, um, and they had some unfortunate things happening to them. Uh, and, but also they kind of uh, gave the finger prick analysis a, a bad name. So then people say, okay, but the finger prick is not the same as the venous blood and so on. But actually then when you read, uh, for instance, it was written up in Nature Biotech, um, they, uh, they call the finger prick up to 250 microliters, right? So we get a six microliter w when we get the finger prick, and I think you have to squeeze pretty hard to get 250 microliters, and then you will indeed uh, get uh, uh, proteins that don't belong there if, if you press too hard. So, so we have done extensive, and especially Philip has probably the best characterized human plasma proteome from all the parts of the body, for instance, and we don't see this difference between the <coughs> Uh, uh, between the sides of where you take it. So, uh, yeah, so then also um, there's a big um, like division in the field of should you deplete and not, and we are in the camp that says you should not. Um, so I'm not saying that's uh, not, n not a good thing to deplete, but, but we are worried about there's an extra step in the uh, uh, clinic so that that would detract from the throughput. And also uh, we are more worried about um, a quantitative aspect. So what we've done here is we've uh, uh, we've taken our plasma proteome, the plasma proteome, and then um, we have taken from um, this paper here from MCP last year, where they've done super depletion, and um, and they are, uh, they found more than 5,000 proteins. Uh, but then when you quantify the common proteins here, you see that uh, so in theory there should be. Uh, maybe offset, but, but it should be a, a, a line here. Uh, and it's not a line. Instead, the correlation is only like 0.3, and also there's two populations. So the one population is uh, um, the ones that, that fairly well correlate. And then here, these are uh, we interpret this population to be the ones that the, where the antibody uh, had a cross-reactivity to another protein. So it was pulling down a protein that wasn't supposed to pull down. So for this and other reasons, we like to um, <coughs> go the undepleted route, but of course that costs us also depth. So we also in the paper analyze the literature so far, and that's a busy slide, and, and I refer you to the paper, but um, yeah, so it's kind of uh, sobering that uh, total proteomics uh, publications go up, basically linear, that's just la this current year, so they go up linearly, they're at several thousand. 7,000 or so per year or more, and whereas the plasma proteome is actually uh, flat, or actually it was the, the uh, lowest number of publications about the plasma proteome last year. And then here we look at all the kind of uh, studies that people use this for, so we know we're starting with the low coverage and we look at metabolic diseases, right? But that wasn't the case in the literature, so people actually, even with uh, much prior technology, they went into like early detection of cancer and so on. And then it's, I would say it's, not a pro, uh, it, it's uh, clear that you will have problems, right? Because um, so they, they just went by the diseases that interested them and not whether the technology was ready for that. And then here's some statistic of that most people actually did only discovery or uh, verification only with like one Western blot or only the verification. So, so then this, I think, explains very well why there haven't been more high profile uh, um, <coughs> Um, successes from the plasma proteomics. So, and on the technical side, uh, of course, we have to deal with impurities. It's, it's a difficult matrix to work with, and we cannot have time-consuming workflows. 
if we want to go to the clinic, and it has to be very reducible, and then uh, inherently we have um, complex protein composition, and a lot of times, even up front, uh, we'll have inconsistent sample collection that we have to deal with. So what we need to have is we need pure peptides, we need the throughput, we need the reproducibility, we need as much protein, protein coverage that we then we can get, and we also need to have a way to, to assess whether the study is actually good. So we've come a, a quite a ways, and this is our, uh, again, our overview. And last year we published the first paper about this, which already contains a lot of um, the technology, the upfront technology that we developed. So that's already, I would say, in, in good hands, and we don't think we need to change this anymore. And then, um, and then um, we learned a lot about the, the, the samples and the nature of the studies. So and then this is what we use there, and um, uh, we um, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. And then our idea is that uh, we get as much depth as we can, and then we get here, especially here, as many points for the same person over time and over as many people and as many studies as we can get. And then this will be like a big uh, matrix. So I'll come back to that, and then we can mine this. And we don't necessarily want like a single biomarker, but we want from the start we want patterns. So um, yeah, so quantitative reproducibility with Philip's workflow um, is um, is very high, and um, um, so that's label free at this point, um, but it's quite good. And these are six typical plasma proteins, which are just technical replicates here, and they um, they are um, quite good. And then we can see where does the variation actually come from. So it comes not so much from analytical or even not intra assay, but it can it comes from variation between people. So they dwarfed the uh, the uh, variability that we ourselves introduce. Um, <clears throat> and it also shows already that, uh, uh, which other people have also reported, that there's a high um, variability of the plasma proteome between people. So and then we, uh, we thought, okay, let's see what, what can we learn from the plasma proteome, even at a limited depth. So here we took uh, volunteers from my group, and, uh, and then we, we asked the question, so can we say who's uh, male and female without knowing that? And then indeed, by in the first component, you can already separate them. And that, this seems like a stupid idea, and, and, and the reviewer said as much. But, uh, but then, uh, actually, I just read a paper in Metabolomics, and they could do it, but only with like 78%, like, which is, you know, and by chance, you get 50-50, maybe. So, <laughs> so this is actually not so uh, bad. And then also, we saw that some people in the lab, um, they uh, separate, so I should also say, they're separating um, genes they are under estrogen control, which makes sense. So, but then the, um, you know, some members of the lab had 100 times higher. So and that's also no mystery because I had like at that point like five pregnancies in my group. <laughs> <laughs> and also po we can also say whether postmenopausal and so on. Anyway, that's just by the way. And then uh, and this is an interesting case. So this is C-reactive protein. So in the US there are millions of, of C-reactive protein tests and that, that is a marker of low level inflammation. Uh, but of course, there's the problem that um, also, uh, in, in a, when you have a cold, it, it will shoot up 10,000 times, right? And then, uh, so, and this is again uh, a person from my lab. So she has the C-reactive protein up, but then, uh, the, uh, but she's not going to die of heart attack tomorrow because she also has this protein up, right? And this is another innate immunity uh, protein, which then indicates together that that this is um, an, an acute and, and not a systemic. Uh, inflammation. So, I mean, this is it's very simple money, but that's uh, uh, that's the idea. This illustrates the idea with the patterns. So, usually we cannot get uh, the um, genomic differences between people, which is also good because then we we are like more on the biochemical side and we don't fall under the genomic regulations. Uh, but sometimes we can, and so for instance here we find that this person has a APOE, the bad variant, right? That gives you the higher risk for Alzheimer, and that's just because it makes a new peptide. And then uh, metabolic risk factors are here. And um, <coughs> uh, these are all the apolipoproteins. So we catch them. And even after all the many, many years of trying, there, there are no um, uh, ELISAs for some of these. They have been very hard to develop. And, uh, and much less do they get all of them all at once, right? So this is already something that's actionable that is of interest to a lot of people in the cardiovascular and the uh, general meta metabolic um, yeah, and then again, so these are the sample quality markers. So, so we can see here. So I can ask you what happened here with this sample. What? 
Exactly. So they uh, <coughs> they uh, lysed red blood cells, right? That's why these guys are here up, and we can say this after the fact, even though they strenuously denied. So uh, yeah, and then also in the limited depth already, you've, you have for historical reasons a lot of the uh, FDA approved biomarkers. So of course we don't want to stop at that uh, depth. So we again take the fractionator, and here we got a quantitative proteome of thousand proteins, but we can now extend this to. Uh, 1,500, and our library extends to 2,800. So we think uh, with fractionation, and our goal is like to do 100 proteomes per day uh, at a depth of, uh, of a 1,000 proteins. So that's our stated milestone. And for that, we will need multiplexing, and we have ideas for that. So yeah, this is also, yeah, so this is our progress. We started with this 2014, then workflow optimization by Philip, library approach, match between runs in Max Kwan. And then we have a new um, scan mode, which I'll explain a little bit more this in my afternoon talk, uh, box card, so that increased the dynamic range of factor 10. And then with the fractions, we are over our, um, over our stated goal here of 1,000, but, but we still need to implement the multiplexing. And this here side illustrates what I already said. The, the known biomarkers, they come all in the, in the top 300, almost. All of, so the density is much, much higher. The density is 23%. Of all the proteins, they are FDA-approved biomarkers. Doesn't mean they're actually used. Um, and here, they're only 4%. So if we say that's an historical accident, there are 280 biomarkers in this abundance range to be found in the future, <laughs> which we believe is the case. So now I'm switching back to the EvoSAP. So now that has come into the workflow. And uh, so this makes our throughput much higher. And uh, so the reproducibility is very high. And we can see, again, our biomarkers here. And we've, for instance, in a short time, can run 100 plasma measurements, and you see um, quite good uh, retention time stability for this. So that's now being incorporated there. And then uh, what I already said, so we have developed, or Philip has developed quality marker panels. So one is for blood taking. Uh, so that, that has to do with what else you introduce in the blood taking procedure. The example I showed you, the red blood, blood cell. And you can also see whether there's a problem with coagulation. Uh, and then we, we have actually assessed, so we've uh, stacked up a lot of clinical um, uh, samples already, or studies, and then we, uh, at the first thing, we um, like spot check them, and we see out of 12 that we assessed, the three had a systematic bias, and, and two have very bad sample quality, right? So then, so now we don't agree to a study before we do, uh, do this, and then we, if it has a, a big problem, we, it's not worth even going into that. And I would say also, when you just do this by ELISA, just like that, you are flying blind. I mean, most of the time it will be fine, but, but if there was a big problem, you would never, never know this. So in this, we have done studies. So this study, I will talk about this afternoon on weight loss uh, by Nikolai here, another Nikolai, and, and Philip. And we're looking at how the plasma program changes when you lose weight acutely, and then you maintain it off for a year. I know what that does to, uh, what that does to um, inflammatory markers and so on. And that study is published at the end of last year. And, um, <clears throat> but I want to here just point out some of the technical issues with this. So we had to measure 1,300 with, that's with the replicate plasma proteomes. And, and then we saw, so we looked at the errors, and they were mainly on the HPLC side. So that's this bar here. And yeah, then we had to clean the mass spec so that you can uh, say that was the mass spec's fault. And uh, yeah, and then a bit empty sample here. Uh, but then also it's interesting when we now see uh, the mass spec is working fine, the HPLC is working fine, but still all this red area that goes to overhead, right? That's due to loading, these are relatively short gradients, so loading, equilibration, and so on. Uh, that, that's all, <coughs> from our point of view, wasted time. So, <coughs> and then <coughs> with ideally with the EvoCEP, we think we can get this part and this part, part um, uh, uh, should be gone. And uh, so, and then what we're doing right now, so, so we are remeasuring because we still have plenty of sample of that same, uh, uh, that same study that I showed you, the weight loss. So these were um, 320 samples, and we did 45 min minutes gradients that time, 50 minutes overhead, quadruplicates, with the uh, downtime because of the errors in the HPLC was 71 days. Now we uh, add this boxcar method, which I'll talk about this afternoon. Then, then we can get the same depth in um, 21 minutes, 
and, and with a three minute overhead. And even if we do quadruplicates, we will go from 71 to 21 days. But because this is an order of magnitude more dynamic range, we don't think we need the quadruplicates, and then we'll be down to six days. And that's, uh, you know, this is uh, why this is important, because if we ever hope to get to thousands of patients, uh, we need to uh, have make these kind of improvements. This is our own study. So we actually did a, a own clinical study, which is kind of uh, also illustrative, because normally we go to what we call freezer studies. So that means the study is already done, published, and we go to the freezer and take it out. But we can still get a lot of information from it. And we don't need to wait uh, like five years whether they develop disease. Uh, but here we uh, wanted to find markers in the, in the blood proteome for exercise because that doesn't exist yet. So we enrolled students, and, and I should we as means a tool here, enrolled students, and we did this together with Bente Peterson in Copenhagen and, uh, and, and Naya here. So then uh, uh, we get all this data from the people, and we uh, got also plasma and urine and saliva, which you're also measuring in the same ways as I show you. Also have a lot of CSF projects at this point, and then uh, that gives a um, quite a number of samples, and they are just sitting there because the workflow is not uh, uh, up to speed. So once we have the EvoSAP and we waiting for the multiplexing, then this can run uh, in very short time, but but uh, not now. So this is a tool, and, and uh, Philip was also a participant in the study. So he's having his VO2 max measured at, at that point. So now, um, uh, in closing, a little bit more um, conceptual ideas that we have. So uh, apart from the uh, problems that have been or challenges before, uh, we also believe that, that, that this year way of setting up the clinical, the biomarker uh, identification is problematic. So, uh, but that was uh, like what you had to do because of the technology. Uh, so what people did is that, like they have very few people where they do discovery. Uh, with shotgun proteomics, and they find as many proteins as they can. That meant hundreds or thousands. And then they have a step of verification. Uh, that could be done by MRM, for instance, and that would be tens to hundreds now, and, uh, and here tens of typically uh, tens or fewer of proteins. And then you have here validation with immunoassays, uh, which could be only down to one or few, and then uh, on a large population. So. Uh, but this requires that people have access to three different technologies in one group. Uh, and this has actually, in our literature review, we couldn't find a single example of where this actually has been successfully done in the sense of also delivering a biomarker. So we are now, so we are, uh, our ambitions are a little bit lower, uh, uh, but we want to measure as deep as we can in like a discovery cohort and, uh, uh, and a validation cohort. And then we'll see what uh, you know, it's uh, changing in one, and, but not the other, and changing in both, and, and, and altered. And, uh, and, and the intellectual appeal here is that we can, uh, in any given, like weight loss, for instance, in any given uh, process that interests you, you test the proteins uh, for once and for all. Uh, and um, interestingly, similar thoughts. So they did it the same way as we're doing in proteomics in the GWASH area before. And now they're also doing in this rectangle what we call rectangular view, and this is expounded on in this review here. So, and then this is our FATM uh, vision. So we want to run through uh, as many diseases, risk factors, uh, treatment studies, and also we're very interested in the healthy. Like Rahul also said, uh, we don't want them to be sick, we want them to remain healthy, and also see what, um, so in my opinion, uh, because I'm vegetarian, I think they should not do this, but they should do this. And, but, but that's just something I'm saying, but maybe on the plasma proteome I uh, can be proved right or wrong. And then we will uh, uh, we'll build up this plasma proteome database uh, that's called a knowledge base, and then if an individual or a small study comes, we can go in there and we can say how that decomposes, what may be the problem, and how can we bring them back to a healthy state. So that's our long-term vision. Uh, and then, um, uh, so, but, but that is long-term, but how can we go quickly? into the clinic, we use the press. There's a stand here, they're called Q-Pressed, but we call them Silac Pressed. We do this together with Matthias Olein. So these are pieces of proteins you, you um, Silac label and put together, and we already published this. Uh, we can quantify 40 proteins at least. And this is a strategy that we can really very well absolutely quantify. And then we have to target them. So in this paper here, we already showed that we can get for the more abundant proteins very low CVs, and now we have strategies to get the same low CVs for much uh, lower abundance proteins. Um, so, and how is the poor doctor going to deal with all this? That's also a big discussion. 
So if uh, so, this is what happened now, and that's difficult enough. But then, when they get more biomarkers, they'll be co completely confused, and uh, and you cannot do clinical trials for all of these uh, thousands of parameters, of course. So we again imagine that we have this. Uh, a, a profiles from uh, a lot of states, and we then we would do random trials where we say we randomly give the doctor the proteomics information or not, and see if that's a benefit, right? And that would be evidence-based medicine. And if that has a benefit, uh, we would say you can use this in the clinic. So that's our idea here. Um, so that in a summary, so we uh, want to go two ways into the clinic. So one is the, uh, with the knowledge base and this rectangular strategy to phenotype humans, better understand diseases, find biomarker patterns, not, not necessarily single biomarkers. And also, it's also idea to use this also together with metabolomics at the same time. And then uh, for direct route, we would do what they're already doing now, but, but also with mass spec and absolute convocation. And we do believe that uh, we, we do need this instrument, otherwise we cannot get the throughput and the robustness on the front side of the mass spectrometer. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank my group and the funders, and these are the two places. And this is also MS Med, where we uh, work in next generation instrumentation with Thermo. Thanks for your attention. So I don't know if we have time for one or two questions. How are we doing for time? Do you have a feeling for where you think this is going to make the biggest clinical impact? Because there's a number of ways, and it sort of comes back to your your last slide, how the physician is actually going to cope with that information. Yeah. Do, do you think it's going to be more diagnosis? Because in a sense, I think one of the challenges is is once we start a course of treatment, and how we manage yeah. it and, 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 and measuring the response to that treatment where it could be yeah, really yeah, very but, powerful. But indeed, so, so we have a collaboration with the Steno Center so they, uh, in, in Denmark, so there's a famous um, diabetes clinic. And uh, so the deal with them is that patients come in, we'll um, use this rectangular strategy, and we say what we think is the case, and you have basically three arms of treatment that, that are applied randomly right now. Uh, and then not only would we say uh, we think it should be metformin or we think it should be physical activity, uh, but also we measure them and say, no, we were wrong, uh, metformin doesn't do anything to you and you should do one of the other things. So that's my long-term goal. Short-term goal is like competing with rare tests where you don't have ELISAs and, and there's nothing now. So that would be, or liver disease, there's basically nothing now. Uh, that would be short-term benefit. And the costs? Uh, yeah, so the costs, um, so the costs are basically the depreciation of the instrument per day that sets the uh, floor. So the, the faster, again, you have the throughput, the lower the cost can be. I think it would be hard to compete with the low-level ELISAs, you know, the big machines I showed you initially. Uh, but or, I mean, in the US, the C-reactive protein test can also cost you $45. So then even the one test, I think you could do cheaper here. So it's, it's hard to say and depends on, on whatever patents and what the insurance company wants to pay and so on of politics too. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. So uh, my question is about regarding post-translational modification. Mm -hmm. In one of your slides, you say that um, you want to study post uh, so PTMs without specific uh, enrichment. Did you already try this? And yeah, so in which was, PTM? Yeah, that actually I said to Jesper's study. So he found that when he got very deep, right, then um, then he could find uh, like methylation, phosphorylation without even enriching, which is very attractive, of course. And so that was in the cellular context, but also here. So for instance, it's interesting, what we get out from this is 20 minutes, we can tell whether a person has diabetes or not, right? And a third of the people don't know they have diabetes, that have it. And that, that's very serious, you can actually do something about it. But it also illustrates the other point, um, people will hate to come to get the plasma protein measured, fancy technology, and before they were happy, come out, they're diabetic, right? They will hate us. So it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues here. <laughs> but yeah, post-sensation modifications are, are definitely also interesting. Thank you. The one thing is not very clear. So uh, all of the quantitation, you use the uh, label free, or you also use the uh, 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 labeled isotope. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking that question. So in the what I showed, the direct path in the clinic, we would use the press. So these these are the the heavy labeled short pieces of the proteins, and so we have uh, internal standards. And indeed, 
we believe uh, or we know that uh, in the clinic, label-free will not be accepted. So we have to, for the targeted, like uh, what I said, that we have to do that. And for the, uh, for the um, um, broader one, if we want to base clinical uh, decisions on it, it has to be not label-free. So we imagine it will be uh, with, with um, labeling, with a multiplexing reagent, and, uh, but we cannot use the current one because of ratio compression and with a reference proteome in every me measurement. So that, I think, will be necessary to be accepted. And yeah, we don't want to make wrong decisions because somehow the peptides was not behaving. <coughs> you probably need to also close. Or yeah. to, yeah. Well, thank you, Matthias. Very, <laughs> very interesting work that has been done and, and much, much more work ahead. Uh, that, I'd like to thank you all for your time with a few closing words. Uh, I think we're running out of time very quickly. Just want to point out that, <clears throat> again, we're, we're going to go in all kinds of different directions. We made this for clinical proteomics. Uh, it, it turns out, as Matthias also points out, that, that there are interesting uses also for small molecules, metabolomics, intact proteins, and where that brings us, we don't know. However, as a practicality, the instrument is now launched. Um, the first production series is ready now in, in a few weeks' time. And we hope that at least some of you will be interested in hearing more about it, perhaps even getting one. Um, but we will be present here for the rest of, of the conference in booth four. Please come talk to us. It's myself and the five colleagues. Also, Nikolai Bache. <coughs> who some of you know, we hired him to do some marketing videos, but it, it turns out that he's also a good scientist who was in fact the one that invented this, this whole plumbing scheme, and he's giving a more technical count on it tomorrow in this uh, late-breaking session at, at 2.50. So please come see him, and thank you for your time today. <laughs>